content warning. The following will contain imagery and discussion on drug use, overdose, death, mental illness, and other potentially triggering subject matter. Viewer discretion. Viewer discretion is advised, is what that was supposed to say. <laughs> um, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. Then. Hey, everybody, my name is Joseph Gordo, and I'd like to welcome you to this week's episode of Toxicology, a weekly podcast available on Facebook, uh, YouTube, soon to be on all your favorite podcast sites, um, where we talk about recovery, addiction, mental health, and everything pertaining to that. Um, so if you're coming back to join us again, welcome back. If you're a first time listener, thank you for checking us out. We hope you enjoy. Um, this podcast is in part sponsored by Recovery Unplugged. So shout out to Recovery Unplugged for helping us put this on. Um, I am uh, the Vice President of Business Development at Recovery Unplugged. And today in the co-host spot, I have Mr. Jason Cabello, uh, a filmmaker, person in recovery, uh, director of content creation at Recovery. I don't know what your title is. That doesn't work. That sounds good. That sounds really yeah. good. <laughs> And also a, client, a former client, also a former client. So yes, shining testimony, grateful uh, alumni, which is which is beautiful. Um, and today uh, we are going to be talking about media representation of addiction and recovery, books, movies, music, mostly movies and TV, though. Um, and our guest joining us for that is Alex Kaplan of Substance dot org a filmmaker um and we decided before we started that alex is way better at telling us about himself than i am so alex tell us about yourself thanks guys thanks for having me this is so cool uh i've been following recovery unplugged for years so to actually be here mm -hmm. and meeting you guys is it's tremendous um so uh i i myself am sober um, and, uh, my issue was alcohol and cocaine. Um, and the trauma that led to it was losing my dad when I was 23. Uh, but also I was raised with a lot of money. I had very high class problems. Uh, when my dad died on the same day I gave his eulogy, we found out we were tens of millions of dollars in debt. And so on the same day, I had everything that made me feel like I belonged to any world that might have been mine taken away from me and uh it was terrifying just your whole and world I, was flipped i was so fucked man like i just i didn't belong anywhere i didn't know how to relate i didn't know who i was you know and i i didn't know how to talk to the people i used to know how to talk to so instead of dealing with it i ran away and i just numbed uh crawled into a deep bottle of booze and under a huge mountain of cocaine and i numbed for four years um and luckily I survived it long enough to seek help for myself and tried a bunch of different things until I found the thing that worked for me. But um, in that same time, I started working in film. I was an actor and I started working in film and I learned how to produce and direct and write and do a lot of different things. And so um, uh, I got to a point where I met a friend, my co-founder at Of Substance, and we had this idea for imagine turning movies from our greatest tool for distraction and escapism into our most powerful tool for healing and growth, right? And so we came up with Of Substance. We're an innovative nonprofit that makes premium entertaining short films, many movies you really like watching, five minute rom-coms to thrillers, but about addiction, about mental health, about trauma, to help us all overcome the shame, blame, and stigma that we experience. So our work is about helping us all feel more seen, heard, and loved, and to better see, hear, and love the people we care about. Like In getting sober myself, the biggest thing I learned is that my issue is far less about using substances than it is about why I use substances. And it's oh, about man. I love shame. everything you have said What's so up, dude? Far. Uh, I think I have a crush uh, on you already. Like, <laughs> it's really nice to meet you guys. I've been dying to meet you for four years. Oh, <laughs> so, Wait, so one... One is uh, for the name of substance. Phenomenal. 
like as a person who works in development and branding and that kind of stuff, like killer, right? Thank Jason, you. do you agree? Oh yeah, yeah. And the, the content is chef's kiss, man. I, I I spent all morning watching it and I was I was pleasantly surprised. I, you know, it was it was because you know we get we get a lot of content thrown our way and and most of it is you know you watch it and you're like yeah yeah this is this is pretty good it has it has you know some good elements of it and I like what they did but 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 his stuff like right from the beginning um you know shoe which we'll watch later um, I was just a big fan of just, it it brought I, I and I and I emailed him as soon as I watched it that it, it just brought me back to a place that I remember very well and do not want to go back to so yeah it was instant I was hooked oh. instantly. I didn't no get to intended. watch it, so you're gonna get like a fresh reaction from me, which is cool. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask you. So when you talk about at 23, right, your dad dies, and then you get the double whammy of realizing that you know uh, the the wealth that had for so long been a big part of your existence and your experience was non-existent. How did you feel watching the show Shit's Creek? <laughs> Yeah, man. Uh, I identified with it a fair amount, but I'm also not a cartoon of a human being. Yeah. So uh, it helped to to be a little bit disconnected from yeah. the cartoons that they are. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, but, and not to make light at all. You know what I mean? But um, that's no. the scenario, right? Where like your your social group, your standard of living, your identity, like just in an instant yeah. gone and and at the age of 23 where i think e even people with very stable lives are still struggling to figure out who they are and an identity and all that kind of stuff so that's just what a challenge that must have been hey man honestly like the way i talk about things with up substance is like if at the root of it all we're all dealing with shame we're all dealing with a fear of not belonging and a fear of not being good enough then really like even though there are a lot of external factors in each of our lives we're all kind of struggling with the same thing. It just looks different. And in the end, we all kind of have the same story. It just looks different. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, my, my, my story is somewhat similar is <clears throat> I, I was raised, um, you know, up until about the age of 11 or 12, you know, my parents were in the music business and, you know, did very well. And my mom just wanted to give me the best life possible. And, you know, it was, I, I, I was, I was quite privileged. And then due to illness and then, you know, the all the things that go around with being in the music industry in the 70s and 80s, you know, the, the, the floor kind of fell out. And like overnight, I, I, I went from like, you know, uh, I think I was about 13 years old to usually having everything that I wanted. Not, you know, I was, I was a spoiled kid. I could admit that. And then all of the sudden, um, my mom doesn't have that to give me anymore. And now she's a, a grown up with problems and I'm having to see that. And it's just like, the fuck happened? <laughs> you know, like this oh, isn't man. the life that I knew. And it's like, you know, things in, and it's, and then, you know, when, when I would go to treatment and then I would be in there with kids who had just the worst childhoods and dealt with abuse and things like that. I'm like, well, my problems aren't that big. So, you know, I, I would, I would minimize my own problems and then that would give me the excuse to stay sick for a while you know that was that was like, your this is why i'm different right oh man i had my, my my i said seven years i made a list of why i was different and you know one time at one of my i would say i think it was like one of my first meetings that uh, i was talking to some guy who had been around for a couple of years and he was telling me like you know you should do this you should do that you know i suggest you do this i suggest you that and i kept on being like yeah but you don't understand blah blah, blah. and then he finally just said like you might be too smart for this program. And I was like, oh my God, thank you. Somebody gets it. <laughs> you know, oh, I, I and now I understand like, what he meant. But I love how both of y'all touched on that. Cause like me, like I always felt like an outsider my whole life, you know, um, whether, you know, from grade school on, right. Like always felt a little square peg round hole. Right. And in getting into recovery and being around people in recovery, and it doesn't matter if it was like a 12 step room or, or just uh, meeting somebody at the gym who's in recovery or, or, or whatever. Right. Uh, there's that communion of this like, oh, like you're the same as me. Like you're you're a, a six foot tall 
you know, biker and you're, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, a guy who grew up in, in Austin or a guy who grew up in Mexico or a guy who grew up in California with money, without money, educated, not educated, punk rock, metalhead, you know, preppy kid. We're, we're all the same. Right. Right. Uh, which is yeah, a there's... beautiful thing. Yeah. It's amazing. And that's that's the thing is we're all we're always comparing each other based on our circumstances and uh, superficially. But uh, if we could get better at just uh, more intentionally connecting on an emotional level. Right. And learning how to just practice vulnerability, just like this is how I feel. This is the thing that makes me feel shitty. Like, yeah what's the thing that makes you feel the same way? Oh, you feel like that too? Oh, we're not so different, right? Yeah. This is this is how we can really start to overcome a lot of our differences that just keep all of us just bashing at each other. Yeah. But to your point about like connecting, being in the rooms, finding people who are just there for you and that make you feel seen. I was uh I got sober in a different kind of group and tell us about that. Guys, tell us about that. Don't don't shy away from that. If if you're open to it, I'd love to hear what what that I'd love is. To. Um so I uh I moved home to Philly in 2013 from New York. I was 27 and I was doing two eight balls a day for five days straight with no sleep each day right? With a bottle of vodka each day to level it out. And then I pass out for two days and do the whole thing over again. And that was me at my worst of using. And I did that for about three to four months. And so I wanted to get sober. And uh, I go home and I, I go to uh, two AA meetings and they didn't click for me, right? I don't think it's about the methodology you find. I think it's about the community. And unfortunately, the rooms that I was going into were rooms of very negative people who were complainers, and it didn't make me want to get sober. So Those are dead um, cat flat tire meetings. Dead cat flat tire. Yeah, but cool. cat that I don't want to drink. I got a flat tire. I want to drink. Oh, it's terrible, right? It's just like it's tough. And then I went to a one-on-one addiction therapist at Penn. And every time I was doing a little bit better and I was feeling better about myself, she would focus on everything I was doing wrong. And I was just like, this is not working for me. This mindset is just bringing me down. And like, you're getting in my way of, of like just emotional growth. And so I was about to give up and my mom put me in touch with this guy, uh, who's a doctor, uh, who runs a private group in the burbs of Philadelphia. And, um, and I went in for a three hour consult and the three things that came up in that consult were Alex life is a patchwork quilt. And the right now, the only patch you have is addiction. And our job is not to get rid of that patch. Our job is to add patches to that quilt and improve your life and build a life worth living of hobbies, of habits, of career, of relationships, of marriage, because, and that that patch of addiction is never going to go away, but it's going to get relatively smaller. It's going to be part of you, but it's not going to be everything you are. I'm like, cool. I'm hearing you, man. The next thing was just like, okay, the first thing we have to do is we have to change the way you look in the mirror. Right now you look in the mirror and you look through society's eyes and you see a junkie, a fuck up, a cokehead, a loser, somebody who has no chance, no potential, no worth. And we need to take those goggles off and get you to look in the mirror and see a human being who has all the value in the world and all the potential possible and with kindness and love. Right. And I'm like, dude, you got me. And the last thing was just like, Alex, what we do in this room is a little untraditional. We don't count days. We, we, we think that relapse is a part of recovery and we don't honestly use either of those words. Um, but really our job in this room is not, to get you to get and stay sober. Our job in this room is to improve the quality of your life with consistency. And so the lesson in this room is not about learning how not to fall. It's about learning how to pick yourself up better and better each time. So in this room, I would come back every Tuesday night and I would leave and I'd get more cocaine for like, and over two years, I just keep coming back. I keep coming back. And every night I wouldn't be judged and everyone would just say the same thing. Just like, don't worry, man. I, I would be honest. I built up the, the skill of being honest because I was in a non-judgmental room that was just like, you're doing great. Thanks for being honest. Don't worry about it. Keep coming back. And 
And so like, I just did. And I kept fucking up and I keep like, I come on Tuesday, I'd leave, grab some blow. I do blow all week, come back Tuesday, let them know I fucked up. But I just started to feel more seen. I felt more comfortable. I felt more loved. And that's that's what we did. It's a room of crosstalk. The doctor facilitates. We have we have a, a topic each week. And honestly, in my um in my group, the doctor does uh oversee people's medication if they want to be on medication, if they don't. Um so some of the opiate guys are on Suboxone, some of the alcohol guys are on naltrexone, um, and some aren't. But in the end, it's just like we come into that room each week and 50% of the time we don't talk about addiction. Most of the time we talk about life, work, stressors of kids and parents and, and loved ones. And we we really get in it. And so it's in that room that I learned to be an adult, to be a good husband, to be to be a professional, to be an entrepreneur. And now here I am. I just, I popped into my group virtually before coming into here to just be like, guys, I'm going to be on this super cool podcast with an yeah. organization that I've been following since I started of substance. And like, I'm here because of you guys. And they were like, fuck yeah. Can't <laughs> wait to listen to it tomorrow. So that's, great. that's my group. That's where, that's where I got sober. Well, shout yeah, out I mean, to Jeff Alex's group. <laughs> Thanks for um, listening. I love I love hearing uh, you know stories that are I don't want to say alternative right but you know non twelve step stories of recovery yeah. um, and you know even bef you know before we we started the podcast mm -hmm. like you mentioned like hey I don't do AA and we're kind of like I don't have to talk about that if you don't want and it was like no like we do. there's a million paths you know um, so it's, so it's great to hear that. Well, what I what I say with a substance is like our movies are just about like the universally relatable human experience regarding isolation, shame, uh, adversity, connection. Right. It's it's the universally relatable emotional journeys that we can all relate to. And so we are uh, treatment agnostic. We don't think that there's one path for everybody. Right. We think that to each their own. But at the root of everything, it's just how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about the world around us. So so yeah. our films are tools to go into treatment in 12 steps, but also into into other other forms, into smart recovery. So, and yeah. So let's talk about films, right? That's why we're here. We're, we're 20 here minutes we go. in. <laughs> we haven't <laughs> that's, that's good. Um, OK, so so uh, addiction recovery. Who gets it right? Who gets it wrong? Do we want to start positive or negative? Uh, well, l let's start with uh, like, so I went to treatment, you know, 20 times. And uh, besides the one time I went to recovery unplugged, every other time I, I had to watch uh, 28 Days with Sandra Bullock, which is not, it, it is not off brand, you know what I mean? And and it's one of those things, the more time I, the more times I went to treatment, the funnier I found it. And it was written by Al Franken, who is, who is in long-term recovery. So, um, Senator, you know, that's at, Senator, Al Franken. Yeah, Senator Al Franken. And he actually he has a little cameo at the end of it. He's running the flower shop. So, um, you know, that, that one is kind of on the, on the silly end of it, you know, but they do deal with, you know, somebody relapsing and overdosing. And um, so that's one of those ones that I, and, and it used to always annoy me. But then in hindsight, and especially when I started like making content on it, I was like, you know, it really wasn't that bad because, you know, if, and if, if I don't have you seen it, Alex? Uh, actually, no, but it's part of my pitch when I talk to people. I'm just like, you've seen 28 days a thousand times in rehab because I hear that that's what <laughs> yes. you do in rehab. Yes. But what if you didn't have to watch the same freaking movie every single time and there were new movies that actually engaged yeah. you? People watch movies for a reason. We like them. We They make us... They make us engage, but like if there's only one fucking movie, that's not helpful. <laughs> well, there's right. a there's a couple other ones. I mean, I think uh, right. Wine and Roses um, is a big one. Leaving Las Vegas is pretty yeah. common too. Uh, I was one. shown the last time I went to treatment, Starlight, 20, 2008, I was shown a film called You Kill Me, which is an obscure one, y'all. It is Taya Leone. <laughs> uh, David Duchovny and um, 
Oh my god. Uh, uh, bald guy, Kings. Something's last name's King. Something. Ben Kingsley. Ben, ben Kingsley. Kingsley. Ben Kingsley is a hitman for the mob. Uh, on the East Coast, and he's a drunk. And they send him to L.A. to go get sober and work at a coroner's office. And uh, while people were coming to try to murder him, so good. Cool. You, think, it's called You Kill Me. Check it out, y'all. I got it. I will yeah. check that out. I think Tay Leone gets the uh, typecast for those roles. She, she seems to play that character quite a bit. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's... Well, the, the early so like, music. Alex, how about you? Yeah. Well, you I know you guys depictions. are. This all st- like, as far as I understand, like toxicology really got going with dope sick, right? Absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah, and I think it's wonderful. Dope sick, I think, is a phenomenal representation, right? Because it's also very human. It shows yeah. the highs and lows of uh, impressive people who can just lose it all, but also just people who society would not consider impressive yeah. just like well, they giving just got it everything so much right got. they got so yeah. many different little things right that it's pro- uh, probably to me like the best depiction i've seen period i agree yeah. i think that though um have you seen grace and frankie at all you know the show with emma thompson or not emma it's thompson. a netflix show they're like old ladies and yeah. their husbands die or they get lily, Tom- yeah, lily tomlin Fonda. Lily, Lily Tomlin Tom and Jane yeah. Fonda. Um, I haven't watched so it, no. Ethan Embry plays one of their sons, and he's uh, in recovery, or he's just out of rehab right at the beginning, and it follows his story a little bit, and it follows him interested in a girl and how he's going to meetings and how he's just like, well, they shouldn't date for the first year, but it really, like, it gets to, you love him. Like it really yeah. humanizes this guy in a comedy, but like, thank God. Like, I think that's what's often missing is that like, because there's no, it's addiction and mental health is often used as a circumstance versus like really digging in a little bit deeper, right? Like it's a, it's a plot point. Like it just mm-hmm. defines this is part of the world. This person has addiction. So we can just yeah. like assume that they're going to be a problem instead yeah. of it, really it's almost get like, to know them. Like sometimes they have a character who's maybe a little bit boring and they're like, let's give him some color. He's a dope fiend, right? <laughs> right. Right. And he's just always on me. Just like, I need more. I need more. I need more. Or like stealing my money or like they're in my way. Right. As opposed to really digging in and just being like, what is this person's humanity? Um, And and I think that when we dig in and we get to explore somebody's humanity, we get to realize that, oh, they're just like me. And they just this is what they struggle with. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great so opportunity that I think is missed all the time. Well, I think, yeah. oh, Jason, maybe maybe you have thoughts on this, but like, it seems to me like a TV show where you have more time is is just a better medium to depict addiction and recovery than than a movie where you got to yeah, wrap something. it up in ninety minutes. Yeah, something episodic definitely plays out, and you know, even when they just get it. <clears throat> even if they get the the disease spot on or whatever it is. So one of my favorite characters from my favorite shows of all time is um, Matthew McConaughey in True Detective. And he is just an unapologetic, functioning, semi-functioning alcohol and drug addict. And like from episode one, he lets you know who he is when he's getting, you know, he, he's getting um, depositioned by the cops and he just opened, you know, he starts drinking you know, pretty much immediately in the, uh, you know, in the deposition. And throughout the whole time, he's just, you know, he's functioning, not so well at all times, but like, that's who he is. And they they get that right, you know, and then other ones that aren't so pretty, I would say like Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood, just one of the worst movie villains of all time and just a complete... angry drunk just you know everything is internalized and you could see just how seething he is and especially the more he drinks in in it the more you just just, it just reminds me of like these really angry people who i would you know in treatment run into and it's just like them against the world you know like i i appreciate those characters a lot absolutely yeah i think um Um, something that's oh go for it no you go ahead alex 
No, I think there's something that's just a little tricky about it is like how much can we really get out of watching a story, right? I think that there is the missed opportunity is following up, like priming us emotionally with a movie to then go into conversations and discussions, right? It's just like, that's how I don't think that movies are the way that they're being made and presented now in like a 90 to 120 minute piece are actually the best use of the medium as a tool to help us grow. Right. And so it's, it's just so tricky. How much are we expecting a movie to actually do to change something about us? If we don't follow it up with like a lesson or class or treatment or therapy or something mm -hmm. else. And so it's just like, well, as a standalone experience, I don't know that it yeah. can do so much. Well, that's always been my big beef with uh, Requiem for a Dream. Uh, that that movie came out like when I was in high school. And even though it made me feel ugly, like dirty by the time it was over, like we were drawn to it, like that, that darkness of it. Right. Um, and, you know, they depict it as like, you know, here's the horrors of the descent into addiction. Right. All these different kind of things that, that do happen. Right. Um, there's no redemption. There's no hope at the end of it. It's just like, I just hear those cellos in my head right now, you know, like, dun, 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 dun. right. And, uh, but again, like what's tricky about it is like, if there is hope, then it's just like, or if it does end happy, it's just like, okay, so what did I learn that it just gets happy because that doesn't actually, how authentic is that? Like True. what part of the story is that ending at? Right. Yeah. And so so that's why I think it's important to have a nice balance of just representation of like when it works out, when it doesn't work out, when it's like good, when it's bad. But then like making sure that that's in a system that lead that follows up with conversation. Right. That leads to just like, how can we think about this differently? How can I mm -hmm. internalize this and develop the deep motivation? that actually leads to me transforming or opening up my perspectives. So one of Alex's pieces that I watched today called trapped, it was just like, it, it was perfect. And how long is it? Is it like four or five it's minutes? Four minutes. Four minutes. And, um, you know, it's going to be boring for me to talk about it, but essentially a woman is having dinner with her brother and she's, he's talking about how proud she, how proud he is of her. And then he leaves she gets up and then walks past the bar and then just all of a sudden gets 100% stuck and it takes you into another world. But it just so it, it just hits spot on to that point where like, especially if you have if relapse is part of your story and people who maybe not have what we have do not understand this. Like there wasn't some some big plan for me to relapse. It was just like I was there. I walked past a bar. I couldn't not do it. Like I had no choice at that moment. And that, and it, it just captured it so well. Well, I think what's really interesting is like, that is usually like the response is just like, when you don't have what we have, you can't understand yeah. it. But I gave that two page script. It's about a woman, uh, Jason, you nailed it, right? Woman having dinner with her brother. He leaves, she goes to the bar. She takes a look at the bar and she decides she's not going to do it. And she turns to walk and she hits this white void of a wall. And she realizes that she can't get through. And then she like, she's back in the bar and then she turns this way and she hits a wall. She is trapped until the only way forward is to the bar and getting a drink. I and it's it. about, it's, it's about like, like, uh, bringing that feeling of the experience of relapse into the world, into life so that everybody can viscerally feel it. And I gave that two page script to my mom who I lived with for five years while I was getting sober and she read it. She was like, is this really what it's like for you? I said, yes, mom, this is what it's like for me. She and got we it. Pull, we pulled over for like 25 minutes. We were in downtown Philly and we held each other and cried for the next 25 minutes because for the first time she could relate to the feeling of trying and failing. Right. And so that was the moment when we finally moved the conversation beyond why can't you stop drinking? Yeah. And two, I see you, I love you, and I'm with you. 
And so like, that's the thing is just like, she is not, she doesn't struggle with addiction, right? She doesn't relapse with that, yeah. but she's a human being who falls all the fucking time over and over, no matter how hard she tries to not make this mistake again and again. And so she can relate to that. Anybody can relate to that. And that's what it. we're you trying know, to do. When you talk about walls, I had this flashback to when I was working at a treatment center, this is probably 12 years ago, I used to tell clients all the time, you know, they'd be in this 30 day facility, you know, 25 days sober, feeling pretty good, you know, maybe not taking their groups too seriously anymore because they know they're about to leave. And I would tell them, I'd say, there is an invisible brick wall on the other side of that gate. Like, you know, it's, I don't like personifying the disease of addiction, right? But it's like, you know, it's, it's like the disease knows that you're in rehab, you know? So it like, takes a break um but once you know free will kicks in or whatever as soon as you hit that gate and can drive wherever you'd like to go there it is you know and you trap right wall 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 um wonderful well, so I mean, I mean uh just before we we get into showing we're gonna show the your your film shoes here in just a second um but I, I do want to just hit, because we, we've talked about some really cool play, things that have gotten it right. And, and especially with, with us talking about Trap, that's a great representation. But what are some, some movies or films or TV shows where you think that they got it wrong? And how do you think that those depictions, um, you know, create an impact, you know, in our community, society, et cetera? So the, the remake of Evil Dead, I think it came out in like 2013, 2014, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. Like With the, the blood rain scene, at the end. Yes. So the, the opening scene, um, this girl and her, her friends and family, they, they, are, they all go to this cabin in the woods um, for her to, to kick heroin. And, you know, as somebody who's kicked heroin quite a few times, like I just watched it and, it, and like it instantly put me in a bad mood because... Opening scene is like her walking up to a well and taking like a nice bag of dope and just being like, I'm done and throwing it down the well and then that's it. So then it's like, and I, and I do understand from like the filmmaker's point of view, he probably didn't want to get into this whole thing, have somebody detoxing. He just wanted to tell a story of where this girl at is in her, where she's at in her life, but I could not get past it the whole time. Yeah. I'm just sitting there with my friends. I'm just, this is and they're like you, this is in evil dead that's where you're going to suspend disbelief is her dropping the heroin down the yeah. well <laughs> yeah for, for, yes, first I, off, that's absolutely yes I, I mean a couple things right first off you, you do the heroin before you're ready right. to you got to finish the heroin right to and to then the other bags that you have in your shoes and then yes. you know but anyway yeah um, no, but I mean, that, that reminds me, there's many a time where I made a resolution, right? And I would finish my dope and throw out my syringes, right? And on at least three occasions, I found myself the next day pulling up to the empty lot where I had thrown them and trying to find them, you know, like, um, Alex, how, <laughs> how about you? What do you think are some of the... The, the poor more detrimental depictions that you've seen i gotta be honest like i don't i don't have them collected in my mind that are just like this movie did it, this movie did that this movie did that but uh i think to jason's point like that is in general how we have simplified the experience of addiction in the media right and in entertainment and in storytelling just as a plot point where it's just like oh this person needs to overcome this thing and we need to show them growing. So they're going to easily just like, I went to rehab and now I'm great. And now everything's fine. And it sets up. I mean, we are just devouring these stories through entertainment all the time. And it sets up these expectations that are so false and so inhuman right? Like, and it sets all of us up to just misunderstand each other and for more shame. And it's just, it's a fucking mess. And so I think that, um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys know this, but like MTV and uh, Viacom have come together with a slew of nonprofits and research organizations to develop a coalition for proper mental health um, 
uh, representation in media. Um, wow. And they are building a lot of, um, not regulatory, but just like um, uh, o- overseeing boards to make sure and judge and confirm and work with filmmakers mm-hmm. uh, so to make sure this, that these things are being properly. Is represented. that the idea of uh, recovery consultants? Like, like you know, if you're if you're filming with a, if you're doing a bunch of karate, you've got a, a judo. I don't know, whatever. You bring in a judo expert, right? It's yeah. the same sort of thing, right? That's a good call. Yeah, I actually haven't heard that term, recovery yeah. consultant. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. But yeah, making, exactly. Making sure it's authentic, right? Right. Yeah. Because like we all see that this is not helping us. And it's like it's just perpetuating stigma. How can we come together to work better, to represent and make people feel more seen, heard and understood while also setting up proper expectations of for the people in our lives who are struggling? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess uh, Alex uh while while Gabby cues up the video behind the scenes, Alex, do you want to give us a little kind of intro into the uh, your your film Shoes real quick? Sure. So Shoe is actually my story. This is something that really happened to me. Not all of our films are. A lot of our films are magical realism and rom coms and whatevers. But um, I figure with what we were talking about today, with um, whether with uh, representation in the media. Like this would be a good one to talk about uh, because it's just very authentic. It's very raw. It's very real. And um, yeah. So thanks for watching. This is, this is shoe. Thanks Gabby. I know, I know. I just, uh, I don't think I need any more, you know, Alex, I came all the way here from Brooklyn. I, I know, man. It's an hour away. I know. An hour. I know. I know. I just, Oh, I just, fuck. You texted me 23 times. Oh, fuck. I just... Alex. I've been up for four days. I don't... I don't think I should anymore. You know this is out of my way. Uh, can I... Can I give you some gas money? Gas money? Yo, what the fuck? Oh my god, I'm sorry. Look, I came all the way here. You gonna give me the money that you promised me. Look, dude, I just... I don't feel so good. You don't gotta take it. But you are gonna pay me for that product that you asked for. Like Manny, Alex. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. How much? Four hundred. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You sure you don't want it? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Look, you're paying for it. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So what you want? Uh, um, just two eight balls. For sure. Good to see you, man. Yeah. Yeah. All right, bro. See you tomorrow.
Wow. See you tomorrow. Oh, wow. <laughs> fucking great. Oh, my God. I have not seen that. I was like this. I was like, oh. is, is, is he going to do it? Is he? I, solid. Solid two yeah. thumbs up for me. Thank uh, you, guys. Thank yeah. you. Um, so, so this, yeah, uh, we made this because, like, it's just like, what if we create an opportunity for people who don't understand what it's like to, to be behind closed doors and see how hard we try to stop doing the fucking drugs, right? And, and how hard it is. And then, like, what it's like to fall and, and how it's just, like, kind of progressive, you know? Um, and, and we made this film about that this film is a story about failure that we made for non-addicts to watch and say like oh my god maybe i'm judging too hard and for people who struggle to feel seen and to feel less alone right and to identify however recently what i started to recognize and this is what substance is working on is we look at that story and we see a story of failure and falling right but you know what I actually kind of see that as a story of achievement and progress and success in a unique way. Like that was the first time Alex got that far and tried that hard to not take the drugs and not do them. And it's just like, you know, it, if, if instead of feeling shame and shitty about falling again, he could be like, Hey, I did better today. I, I guarantee you will expedite his process and progress to treatment and getting better. It, it's well, so, all about improving the way we feel about ourselves and our positive emotional intelligence. As a, as a clinician, right, there's these stages of, of recovery, right? And they start before you stop the drugs, right? There's, there's pre-contemplation where like the thought of stopping has never even crossed your mind, you know? But then there's this stage of contemplation, right? And, and I've never really seen it depicted as accurately. Cause that's, as, as I was looking at, it's like, he's, he's what you were just saying, right? He's contemplating, right? He, he has a sense that he wants to get sober or not do drugs. Right. Uh, maybe even a little bit of a desire to stop, but um, is, has still not taken any action or been unable to, to, to begin to take action. And that's, that's what I saw in that. Yeah, and it's like I love when I get calls from like old friends of mine, you know, people who maybe I used with or people who I knew before I used, but they know that I've gotten clean. And then they'll call me and and say like, "Man, I'm, my life is fucked up right now. I need help." And like, you know, they'll they'll ask me what they should do, blah blah, and then you know, I'll I'll, I'll give them some suggestions and then, you know, I'll I'll hit them back up in a couple of days especially if i don't hear from them and then they'll, they'll think that like i'm gonna shame them because they were like you know yeah you know this i'm like listen man you you did the, the hardest part is done right now you made that initial attempt to get some help so now you know you have me to call um th there's plenty of people who you know i could hook you up with some other people if you want but now you know like anytime you could call me i'm not going to shame you there, there's it, it's a beautiful thing when you make that first that first attempt to just say like hey you know I, I i've seen you do it like how do i do it and like you know you could call me a hundred times like I, i'm not i'm not going to give you any shit for for not getting it you know yeah. yeah um some details that i noticed that that i thought were really well done in the film um was you know that first name sort of familiarity that you have with the with your dealer but you know but ultimately, right, that's that's false, right? Because at the end, you know, a Manny was just like, look, you're going to pay me, period. Like, this is a business transaction. And then right. as soon as the as soon as the money changed hands, the tone changed, right? Like, OK, have a, have a good day. See you tomorrow. You know, <laughs> like, um, yeah. like, uh, you know, because, right, we do that with our dealers or I did at least. Right. Where it's like, you know. How are the kids? Like, let's talk for 15 seconds real quick to make this not, you know, feel slightly less dirty. Um, you know, uh, 
Well, yeah. I, I think to your point of just like being in that place of contemplation, right? Where he hasn't actually put any steps in place, right? Yeah. And thinking about like, you look at this and you're just like, whoa, the person he's confiding in and actually asking for help is his dealer because that's a person he sees most of the time. You know, I mean, we, that's the person he feels closest with, even though it's not a real deep relationship, but he's, he's reaching out in the weirdest way to the weirdest person. And it's just, it's fucking crazy what we go through. But I think that's that first step of just like, yeah. It's so accurate too, especially if you have like your one connection, you know what I mean? Who, I'm putting their kids through college. You call them, you know, you're spending a ton of money with them. I've, I've had drug dealers too drop me off at detox just because it was this like, man, you, you're not, you're not doing good. Like, I don't want you to die. And they, they actually took me to detox and like dropped me off. And it's like, when you, when, when you hit that point, when you, you're seeing this person so much, you probably see them more than you see most of your friends. Yeah. And you build this, this, this false relationship, but you know, they're human beings too, you know, even though, you know, what they're doing is pretty nefarious, you know, deep down, I've, I've had some, some really good heart to hearts with some drug dealers who were just like, man, you're going to die if you don't stop. <laughs> Same. <laughs> so Same. they're, they're going to lose business one way or another. Either I'm going to die or I'm going to get clean, you know? You know, that's a great point like that. You know, the, for most of my using, I had at least one or two kind of running buddies that like we'd hustle together, you know, if, if only one person had money and we'd like fix everybody up and then go, you know, try to make more money. But the last six months of my using, I, I was, Jason knows this, but like I was pretending I was sober, right? Like my family thought I was sober. I was going to 12 step meetings and was actively involved and in sharing like, Oh, I used to be like that and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the only person who knew, was my dealer so he was the only person that like fully knew me at that point right but that dealer i'm not gonna say his name but he was my dealer for years and once i called him i just gotten out of detox and he was like hey i hadn't heard from you in a couple days what what happened so i was in detox and he was like oh do you still feel bad and i was like no he's like didn't give you any pills or anything like no yeah they gave me some xanax and they gave me some uh some some Ambien to sleep and some Clonopin for anxiety. Like I got him right here. He's like, dude, take the pills. Like let, let me let me just drive you home and take the pills. And I was, he 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 tried a little bit to not sell me drugs, and, and, and then eventually he sold to me. And then one time I was in rehab for a year, walked five miles to this guy's house, showed up at his door unannounced because I didn't have his number anymore, and again. Where have you been, Joseph? I, said, I was just in rehab for a year. I've been sober for, for a year. And he just looks at me and shakes his head. And he goes, and here you are fucking up already. And I was like, Get yeah. Get in here. <laughs> Come on. <man." laughs> but uh, um, yeah. It's the nature of it, man. That's such a weird relation. You know, I've never really thought about my relationship with my drug dealer. Well, yeah, there's so- some complex relationships there. Here's here's a perspective that's yeah. a tricky one that I don't usually bring up. I wasn't planning on bringing it up today. Um, Let's go. But like, so so we have clinical guides that go with our films that we're we're starting to take nationwide to treatment and private practices. And so in building those, we talk about the relationship and we talk about empathy and compassion. And we talk about, especially with this film, like what is it that we're assuming about Manny, right? And we are villainizing Manny as addicts the way non-addicts villainize us. And it's just like, what if we, what if we stepped inside Manny's shoes, right? It's a black dude from Brooklyn came from likely a tough spot, has somebody to answer to. He's probably not the supplier. He's just the messenger boy. And if he shows up with no 400 bucks, he, he might be in some deep shit. Right. And that's his paradigm and that's his circumstance. And so, like, we just bring this up not to be like, hey, drug dealers are cool and they're great and they're helpful and we should be very empathetic. But instead, it's just like taking a step back and being like, how are we judging and putting these expectations on others while if we just take a step back, 
um, we might be able to just humanize each of us and each other. No, and I think you did a great job with that because even when he was kind of like, listen, I came here, you're going to pay me. It wasn't in a threatening way. It was like, a, am just a guy trying to do my job here, you know, like yeah. let me do my job. Like you, you had me come all the way out here, you know. I, I really appreciate the way that you that you frame that. Yeah, very Thanks. matter of fact, just it is what it is. Yeah. Right. Just this one is right. And um, so so like the reason I really wanted to show this, we, we were going to show something else. And usually I show trapped, but we were going to show band-aids. And now we ended up showing shoe was because of the topic of this this conversation. This this discussion is about um, portrayal in the media. Right. And so this is just as raw and as real a piece as we can get. Right. And so, I, I mean, not as we can get, it could get bloody well, more graphic. Well, you know but. what, but without, without being graphic, you know, like that felt heavy, that felt powerful, but you know, it wasn't, you didn't see a, a straw, you didn't see a dollar bill, you didn't see white powder, you didn't see a spoon, you, you know, um, you didn't need to. Yeah. Which is, and, you know, that's hard to do. And, you know, you know, a big takeaway for me was how small his world was. It was like that. You, his whole world was the frame, like, and that was it, you know, and you could just see him yeah. after, after, after the, the shot ends, he's just going to be pacing back and forth in that world for that days and right days there. and days. Yeah. And that it was that, I, you know, and, and that, that, that's why I enjoy your work so much is like, I can picture what's happening after this, the, you know, after the credits come on and, and, you know, that, that's not always the case, man. So, I mean, really, really well done, Alex. Thanks, man. Yeah, the um, the biggest thing about it is like uh, like we were talking about is just like if it needs to be quality because if it's not high quality, then I'm not immersed in it and I'm judging the like I'm seeing the strings. So we need to make sure people are immersed and we need to make it entertaining. But at the same time, like the issue of everything and the subject of this talk is that like it needs to be authentic. So the rules for the films that we make are that they have to be as immersive, entertaining, and and high quality as they are challenging, authentic, and insightful on some perspective of addiction, right? And so that's where we are coming in a little bit differently than I think, you know, media in the past has come in, where it's just like being very surface and not necessarily being authentic, and making sure that we're like, Every single time we decide to make a film, it's just like, what are we trying to say? What is the conversation we're trying to start? Who are we trying to help feel seen, right? And so, so that's what we're working to do because I think like, you know, you guys were already having this conversation. I just happened to fall into it. It's just like, this is the conversation. This is the problem. So like, how can we fix this? How can we help? So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. One of the things that we we mentioned sometimes on the on the show, right? Because so many times people will in the comments say like, you know, what can I help or how can I start this conversation? It's like you're here, you're actively participating in the conversation by attending. You are part of the solution inherently by your presence, right? And um, and I love that, right? Because then this lives on on YouTube, and who knows who watches it, and something happens, right? Um, we were talking before the show, Jason, about a, a mutual friend of ours that had some benefit from casually overhearing the show last week because his wife had it on on her laptop, you know? Um, so that's, that's, that's beautiful. And that's why I love doing this. Um, so we're getting towards kind of wrap up time. I just scrolled through all the comments and even though we had a really great conversation going, a lot of really good participation, um, no one asked us any questions today, which is, which is a, a, a unique thing. They just all started naming movies. And the one question we got is, do you guys do this every night? <laughs> you know, because they wanted to know if they could watch it again tomorrow, which is a cool question. Um, so I'm going to give a, a, a last chance call to our to our viewers if you want to throw a question in the chat. In the meantime, I thought it'd be kind of kind of fun, or um, you know, just to run through a couple kind of round robin, real rapid fire questions. Um, so uh, let's start with. Best depiction of a 12-step uh, meeting in TV or film? Anybody? Dope sick at the end. No? Dope sick at the end? Yeah. Yeah. I, 
there was, and, and I'm, I'm not even a fan of the show, but there was, I, Mom, I think is the name of the show. Is that the show with? Um, yeah, I never watched it. Yeah, with. Uh, I, I've only caught like if I was at my mom's house, she would watch it. It would be on TV, and I remember just watching it and being like, "They really, they, they really know what they're doing here." Like somebody, one of the the showrunner is probably in the rooms. You know, the showrunner is. Uh, sober herself yeah. and has been so it's very it's very authentic i keep hearing about it and i keep not watching it so i'm gonna have to check that one out okay if uh jason since you're the the 12 step guy here if you could pick one avenger to be your sponsor which avenger would it be i've never i don't think i've ever seen an avenger movie but you know who the avengers are don't act like you don't i i could honestly the guy with the glove i don't know Okay. 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 I don't even know. I'm not seriously. That's not my. That's not my. My well, world. All right. All right. Okay. I got How one. about? Okay. Go. Yeah. Alex, I would go with the Hulk. Hulk. I'd go Why? I go with uh, Banner. I think he's. I think he experiences what we experience most, like between like he's holding in this monster all the time, right? And so like yes. when he's just Banner, he is so kind and he's so down to earth and he's so easy and he's just like, I feel like there's a lot of empathy and compassion in there. He's it's smart as like, fuck. <laughs> he's smart as fuck. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Bruce, Bruce uh, well, Bill Bixby as, as uh, from the old Hulk show from the 70s. That's, that's the Hulk that I'm familiar with. Yeah. <laughs> No, not not even Lou Ferrigno. No, <laughs> that's who. That's who Lou Ferrigno played the Hulk. Bill Bixby played Bruce. Oh, Banner. okay, okay. Wait, I got you. Joseph, I got you. what about you? Yes. Who's yeah. um, if if an Avenger had to be my, sp I mean, well, man, you nailed it with the Hulk answer, but um, I would go with. You know what? I would go with Vision, because like Vision would not care about my feelings at all and be very directive and that's what i need i i that's need cool. clear cut do this you know yeah. that's a good uh, call yeah right, i got a question for you guys Go is there me. any movie or scene from a movie that makes makes it look still attractive to you to be like mm, yeah I, I missed that i got this one immediately in pulp fiction yeah, right after true. right after John Travolta uh fixes and he's on his way to pick up Uma Thurman and driving in the car chilling in the car yeah that's that that's one. my pick too that was <laughs> that's a good one that's better than yeah. mine. Oh, I had no idea that was so universal <laughs> well I think you know same drugs of choice yeah. what about well, you I Alex think, but, but but real quick part of what I like about that so as as a former heroin addict, a recovered heroin addict, you know, so often the heroin addict is just depicted as fixed zombie. And and that's not the case when you're fully in it. You know, it's fixed function. You know, and that's what I always liked about that is he feels good, but he's driving, he's fine. <laughs> Very, yeah. 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 He he had asked somebody on set if he if anybody knew anybody who had done it before and they found somebody. And was like, imagine that you just drank a bunch of tequila and took a warm bath. And then that's where his inspiration was to be like. Fun fact. <laughs> All right, Alex. Now, um, you know, it's funny because the one that comes up is not usually the thing that comes up. There's a scene in Westworld um, uh -huh. when what's his name? Uh, I always forget his name. Uh, the old guy who owns the place. Um, Hannibal Lecter, the guy who plays no, Hannibal Lecter. No, the other one, the guy who actually owns it. Oh, God damn it, Ed, uh, Ed from The Rock. Oh, oh, oh. He's he's just in a really swanky, sexy hotel like lobby, and he's sitting with this really like high end scotch, and it's just like it's just sexy, like Mad Men sexy, and it's just like one of those there's round just, ice cubes. Yeah, right. it's gorgeous, right? And those are those are often the things that get me are just like people like still the romance of it and the sex about it. Kind right? of sophisticated, kind of elegant yeah. depictions. Yeah. Totally. While at the same time, the thing that usually gets me that makes me feel sad uh is when I watch just camaraderie, just like not people getting wasted, but just like friends in a bar. Just like meeting at the bar, meeting at the bar, meeting at the bar. And there's just like yeah. 
that camaraderie around just like having some beers. And it's just like, yeah, I wish I could do that, but I yeah. can't. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, like I get that, but then it's like, no, yeah, I can't do that. I've never do it. And, and the truth is for me, when people ask, because like, you know, uh, my wife is a normie. And so we have a lot of normie friends who drink and every Mine now too. and then it, every now and then it comes up and they're like, so you can't have like one drink. And it's like, you don't understand. I've never had one drink. I've never had a desire <laughs> for one drink. Right. It, yeah. I've always desired oblivion. You know, yeah. so Beautifully instead said. I face. I face the stark reality of the world as it is. <laughs> um, Here we go. So, uh, Jason, any closing thoughts before we wrap it up, bud? I think we should give it to Alex. Alex, any closing thoughts before we wrap it up, sir? Um, so, the yeah. floor is yours to say what you want. And if you want to go ahead and throw a pitch out there where people can see more of your stuff, go for it. Totally. Uh, guys, thank you so much for having me on here. This has been one of my favorite conversations I've had in a while. You guys are awesome. But uh, thank you all for listening. Um, go check out ofsubstance.org. Our films are free resources that are on our website to help you in a pinch, to help feel seen, heard, and loved, and feel a sense of belonging when you feel lonely. But also, they're helpful tools to share with your loved ones to help you show the things that are hardest to say start to build those bridges. So check them out, use them, please. Reach out, go to our website, subscribe, get in touch. Um, we also source our stories and our films from real people. So we encourage you to go to our site and submit your story to inspire our next short film and get involved in the process. So thank you guys so much. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I speak uh, globally, actually, at this point. We come and we offer really fun, immersive experiences for your synagogue or your church or your school or your corporation, wherever. We'd love to come show some movies and dive deep into some vulnerable conversations. Um, and just to close that up, just remember you're not alone. You're not crazy. We get it. Love it. Alex, thank Love you it. for for being our guest and for your time tonight for, for a great conversation. Um, thank you to everybody who tuned in. I hope that that for whatever reason brought you here tonight, that you heard something that you needed that you can take into your life to help yourself or help someone else. Um, I'm thank you for reminding us. I'm really bad about this. You know, if, if you like this and you want to see it every day or every every week, you know, please follow us on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. Um, I have a personal Facebook. Jason. Does Jason have Jason has a personal Facebook? Yes, he does. <laughs> Reach out to us. Um, or um, if you had a question or a comment that you felt uncomfortable or you know, posting in the general chatter, please feel free to message Recovery Unplugged on our Facebook group. Um, and uh, we need to come up with like a catchy sign off phrase, Jason. We do, we do, yeah. and that's been the movies with Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> did you want to say something jason before you cut it no i'm good <laughs> well if if I, i'm gonna try i'm gonna try one out all right we'll see if it comes back next week so if if today's your first day sober or your last day not sober i'm proud of you we're proud of you thanks for listening to toxicology